Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. It's me, I'm back and I'm here with the most awesomest person in the world. Of course, it is Alex. Hello. Who have we got which, on? Which, which Alex are you talking about? Uh, sorry, who are you? Where have you been? Um, do you even work here anymore? I do places. I've been to places around. I probably don't want to know where you've been, if I'm honest. Uh, more importantly, we have a guest here today who's far more interesting than you. Uh, we have. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to do. Um, we're going to jump into some interviews with all of the fabulous people that were shortlisted for this year's Wolfson Prize and talk to them about the books that they wrote because I think it would be a really good idea. Um, this one that we're going to talk about today was probably it was the most topical by far because it all came out of lockdown and actually before we started recording we've just been waffling on about lockdown and everything uh, we have with us Alex von Tunzelman uh, her she's a historian author and screenwriter she's written books including Red Heat Conspiracy Murder and Cold War in the Caribbean Blood and Sand Suez Hungary and the Crisis that Shook the World but the book that was shortlisted this year was Fallen Idols 12 Statues that Made History Alex welcome thank you guys for having me on the show Oh, this is brilliant. What what made you want to touch this with a barge pole? Because to get this written and out when it was out, you must have been like, damn it, I'm going to write a book about this just as it was all happening. Absolutely. That's precisely what happened. I mean, it was a subject I've been thinking about for quite a long time. So I'd already been a bit involved, you know, 2016, when there was a fuss over the Cecil Rhodes statue in Oxford, for instance, I wrote a piece for history today at that time. And I'd been thinking about statues and symbolism. They've come up in quite a lot of my work. But when you know, the kind of uh, process that kicked off Black Lives Matter and so on and the pulling down of Edward Colston's statue in Bristol, I thought the debate around this is so poorly informed (laughs) that somebody's (laughs) got to write a book. Um, And I'm somebody, so I wrote a book. Uh, And, you know, like many of us in lockdown, I, you know, didn't have a lot to do. So I did write the book. You know, I mean, it's all I did. Do you know what, brilliantly. I'm very busy. (laughs) I've got a friend who's walking around Westminster Abbey today and she's sending me pictures. And I love the very British way in which Westminster Abbey have punked the people we don't like anymore. So Cecil Rose is basically (laughs) above a fire hydrant on a manky wall where you wouldn't even (laughs) spot him unless you knew he was there. And when you go in now, you know, as you go into Westminster Abbey, there's that monstrous East India Company memorial. They now use that as a furniture storage thing. So when you go past, (laughs) basically racist corner just has a load of chairs piled up in it. So you can't see the East India Company. It's brilliant. It's so very British and passive aggressive the way that they've dealt with it without having to start pulling down stuff inside the abbey um but there's so much to talk about there uh, here isn't there so let's start with the obvious one Alina you've already asked this before we went on air haven't you about simplicity in this debate I did actually and I put the quotations marks and not that anybody can see me doing quotation marks of simplicity uh but I am just for everybody to know I am doing quotation marks in the video at the moment but because it's not so simple is it I mean pulling down statues well this is it I mean what I wanted to do is inform the debate a bit because what was happening is that in the media it was being characterized very much as a sort of modern culture war very simplistic issue you know conservatives love statues want to keep them up progressives hate statues want to pull them all down and I mean people have such short memories because really very very recently before that you know 2014 for instance in Ukraine the Lenin fall in fact what we saw was a lot of right-wingers really applauding the pulling down of Lenin statues and some Western progressives being quite unsure what to think about that. Of course, you go back to the fall of communism, that was happening again. Fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, again, that was happening, That you know, conservatives were supporting that. So actually what we can see very, very quickly looking at that history, you know, even to go back further to the French Revolution, English Reformation, all these other times, there have been big waves of statue pulling down, is that actually people's opinions on this don't fall into a very simple cultural binary. What it depends on, quite rightly, is who the statue is of, what it means, what it's come to mean in the present, who's supporting it, why it's up, why it might come down. Is it nice? Is is it attractive? Is it ugly? So all sorts of factors that are quite complicated that actually people don't tend to have 
a completely blanket opinion on whether statues should go up and come down. And that's quite right. People should respond differently to different statues. I think brilliantly, I found it must be from um, after the First World War because it's Strasbourg. So it must be when it went back over to France. There in Strasbourg's little town museum, there is a squished William, Wilhelm the First head where the statue got dragged through the streets and run over by a cart. And now the squished head is on display in the museum, which I thought was absolutely fabulous. Uh, but like this is the kind of project, isn't it, where you could go off on an existential waffle. Um, and not make very much sense at all. So I think it's really interesting that you, ch- yeah, I'm looking at a leader and she's pointed at herself. <laughs> with my existential waffling. Uh, so you grounded yourself by picking 12 statues in particular, which I think was really clever. OK, why those 12? Well, I particularly wanted to look at modern statue mania and the result of it. So statue mania was a phenomenon in the late 19th, early 20th century. That's what it was called at the time, like Beatle mania, statue mania, when really hundreds of statues were put up um, in Europe, in North America, in colonies, these places. Um, And really, I think that that culturally was the sort of response to the great man theory of history, which Thomas Carlyle, of course, described in the mid 19th century. The idea that history was just about the biography of great men, that you had these figures in history that through their great virtue had changed everything. And, you know, the little people didn't matter. It was all about these big leaders. Um, He only described men. Um, He didn't mention any women in his book on it. He did mention one man of colour who was the Prophet Muhammad. Um, So when I was doing the book, I was thinking that statue mania, when all these statues went up, was this response to Carlisle. So I deliberately picked 12 statues who were all men. um, And there are, well, there are sort of two men of colour. There's Saddam Hussein and um, also Rafael Trujillo, although Rafael Trujillo insisted to everyone that he was white. But he was, in fact, he's it's like that same <laughs> Chappelle sketch where he's blind, but he, he's a racist and he's blind and he thinks he's white. That's You've got what, the idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was quite a deliberate framing was actually not to pick. I mean, actually, you know, from that period, there are some statues that were mostly Queen Victoria. Um, but there yeah. are a few others, people like Florence Nightingale and so on. But actually, I was more interested in, in really exploring it through this idea of great men and why we are responding now to that. It, when, we'll move on to that in just a second on the next question. But can I? My perception of this is that this this great man statue thing. How many of these things were funded by their own wills and things? I mean, they're literally leaving behind money to put up statues of themselves, aren't they? In some cases, that is exactly yeah. what happens. Um, in a lot of cases as well, there is what's called a campaign for public subscription. So it said that there's a fundraising effort to raise the money for the statue. But the more I looked into it, the more I realised that was largely untrue. When they say there was a fundraising effort, just as today, if you tried to raise money for a statue, lots of people would say, well, I'm sorry, but I really think there's more important causes, you know, like old ladies who want hip operations or, you know, arts, charities or anything else. So it was very hard to raise money to put statues up so what quite often happened is that the person who started the campaign just ended up paying for it themselves as a sort of vanity project Um, and often that was a person who wasn't necessarily connected to the historical figure whose statue they were putting up but they were putting it up for for reasons they deeply believed in reasons of their own you know perception of history so it's not done democratically it's generally done by private interests of some sort or of course by regimes in the case of people like Stalin. I was actually going to ask, this might be a little bit of a stupid question, because so, for example, you come to Poland and I'm going to tell you every city, every town. okay, not every village, that's kind of pushing it a little bit. You will always find a statue or a memorial to John Paul II or uh, Josef Piłsudski, like the two most common statues you will see everywhere. I mean, Warsaw, I think, has like four. It's ridiculous. Um, no, it's not ridiculous. That's, that's Sorry, my fellow Poles. I apologise for that comment. But it, I'm curious. You're going to get for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to pull your statue down now. <laughs> yeah, I've got to move. Um, yeah. I, I want to know, it, I know England's not the same, this sort of like idealistic of, of cult but is there a statue that you just, apart from obviously Queen Victoria's quite a lot, is there a statue you see a lot of or that we just don't notice? I mean, it is really Victoria who is the one you would see in, you know, a lot of most big British cities probably have some sort of Victoria. If they don't have a statue of her, then they will have certainly a Victoria street, a Victoria, you know, memorial of some sort, all of that. Um, so she's kind of the one, and there's not really, I mean, even if you look at someone like Winston Churchill, there's nowhere near as many statues of him 
Um, it's not even getting close. I mean, there are, you know, and there are a few around of various people like Shakespeare and so on, you know, some cultural figures. But I would say that, I mean, I haven't done the, run the numbers on it, but I would be amazed if anyone apart from Victoria came out um, up front in the UK. Um, and of course, she was in a lot of colonial places as well. So, I mean, there were um, dozens of statues of her in India and there are some still up now um, and in what's now Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. We did interview actually an Indian historian who deals with colonial architecture and things in India, um, who said like, for better or worse, she it, it is her city, Calcutta is her city. Um, and yeah, it's full of Victoria. Um, you've already mentioned Saddam Hussein. We're going to talk about this one because this predates the madness a couple of summers ago. I like it might have been last year, but 2020 and 2021 have completely merged into one big ball of depression for me. I have no idea which one was which. But the, that statue madness, the Saddam Hussein thing was famous when he got yanked down, wasn't it? Um, so talk to us about the circumstances about that, because that predates sort of what what kicked off your drive to write this book. Yeah, so this one is, it's a weird story. This one is from 2003, um, what was called Operation Iraqi Freedom, when uh, the US and its coalition of allies, including the UK, invaded Iraq to try and you know, remove Saddam Hussein. Um, and it's a particularly weird story because it's sort of the story of how, like putting up a statue is an attempt to tell a story about history in some way or other. This is a story about how someone tried to make a story out of the pulling down of a statue. And it's a funny one because it's kind of a bit, questionable how why that occurred so um it was at the time this huge news story it was played on all channels so if you're watching uh, cnn you'd see it every eight minutes in the 48 hours after it came down if you're watching fox you would have seen it every four minutes so you know it was replayed constantly as a symbol and everybody was talking about this as a berlin wall moment when this huge statue in further square was pulled down you know that this was really symbolic really important Um, Even George W. Bush called it a Berlin Wall moment. You know, everybody was kind of talking in these terms. But actually, when you look into it, first of all, that statue really wasn't terribly important at all. Um, There were thousands of statues of Stam in Iraq. But also, interestingly, they had been being pulled down at the rate of literally daily um, by British and American forces. Um, And also lots of them by Iraqis themselves. Um, And it's just that this one was the one that happened to be pulled down opposite the hotel where all the journalists were staying. So there were people to film it, whereas the other occasions there weren't necessarily film crews present. Um, So it was kind of drummed up a bit. And it was also pulled down. I mean, there was um, there's an Iraqi guy called Kadim al-Jabouri who said he went there with his sledgehammer. Um, and started to whack at it a bit but it was pretty big so he couldn't do very much Um, and actually the crucial factor in pulling it down was that American forces decided to get involved and it was quite interesting because they weren't given really it was their idea they weren't being given orders from the Pentagon go and pull that statue down in fact the Pentagon was pretty squeamish about it happening quite worried about it happening Um, but they did get involved and eventually they had to use um, an armoured vehicle to pull it down I mean there's no way the Iraqi crowd in Fudges Square that day would have got that statue down by themselves it's just too big Um, so it was sort of you know sold as this kind of great moment of the Iraqis pulling down the statue being freedom but it really wasn't that at all and of course a sort of symbolic assassination of Saddam Um, and actually of course Saddam wasn't found for many many more months Um, the war wasn't over at all at that point but it was sold as this I say Berlin Wall moment the idea that it was somehow this kind of emotional victory um, in the invasion of Iraq and of course as we all know in fact that story wasn't remotely over it when it's still going on today in fact. It's mad, isn't it? I vaguely remember it as well because it was a really ugly statue, wasn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah, not good at all. In my head, like, I've not seen the footage for years, but it's kind of like that horrible David Lloyd George Lego Man statue in (laughs) Parliament Square. Like, it looks like a child moulded it. It it really wasn't a good effort either. Well, I mean, it's funny, there's two artists who both claim to have made it, so uh, I'm sure they would disagree with you, but they can't have based on it, so uh, one of them is mistaken, I'm afraid. But yeah, that's part of the surrealism of the whole story, is is that even different people claim to have made it in the first place. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been... It's sort of, and it's, the funny thing is, it sort of worked. I mean, as I say, it kind of convinced a lot of people around the world. After that happened, coverage of the Iraq War dropped to a very, very low level on TV, even though it was still going on. Is that actually people did take it as a sort of moment of closure, which it really wasn't. I mean, of course, for soldiers on the ground or for Iraqis at all. Um, as I say, it was very far from over at that point. Um, but funnily enough, it does seem to have had an effect in that lots of Iraqis as well as Westerners were pretty delighted to see that footage. <laughs> 
so uh so it didn't you know it kind of as a piece of propaganda it sort of worked in an interesting way but it's quite surreal because it wasn't you know you, when you saw things like those statues of Felix Zizinski being pulled down at the end of communism for instance that was happening quite organically you know that was people going into a square and doing it whereas this really was American forces doing it and initially one of the American soldiers uh, climbed up it and flew an American flag from the top of it and that caused like the Pentagon was on the phone going get that down get that down right now Fox News would have loved that yeah so they hauled that down pretty quickly and put up an Iraqi flag instead um, to make it look a bit less like a conquest just see someone over it <laughs> with their head in their hands going I, I mean absolutely down. yeah no, don't do that it's a bit like Berlin, really, having a Soviet flag fly high over Berlin in 1945. There you go. Um, very symbolic. Uh, but yeah, exactly. The wrong symbolism. That was, that was not welcome. <laughs> so they got an Iraqi flag. I mean, it's in quickly. the name of the opera. I love the Americans with their operation naming. In Britain, they're like, well, we're just, should we choose random words so that it can't be like political <laughs> construing anywhere? Yes. Operation Iraqi Freedom. <laughs> means no American flag flying, <laughs> yeah. please. I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, rather than us calling things stuff like you know Operation Bowler Hat or Operation, yeah, Rebecca, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> <could> possibly infer <laughs> any political allegiances from the name of the operation yeah. or any operational planning or anything. No, they don't care. It's like Operation Hoorah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My friend Love Dr. It. Napton actually did. Uh, she told her, talk, talked to me the other day about Operation Carrot, and you don't, you know, it just sounds really like, oh, that sounds really nice. No, it's not. It's about getting rid of poles out of displacement camps and cutting contact. It's ho- it's a horrible freaking operation, and all it's known as Operation Carrot. Like some Whoever Beatrix Potter thing. Yeah, Whoever <laughs> named it hated carrots, didn't they? Yes. <laughs> they really. hated carrots. Yeah. I didn't. Safe to say, though, don't you reckon that no one really cared um, when that one came down, apart from possibly Saddam himself, although probably staying alive was more in his priorities at that point. Uh, Was there any sense of it setting a precedent, though, that led us to where we were during COVID? Because you point out in the book, don't you, it's a long way from being the first statue to be pulled down. But at the same time, it is high profile. Yeah, I mean, there's a long history of, pull- I mean, basically a statue is a symbol, you know, you put it up, I mean, it might be a piece of art, some of them are artistically valid, some of them, as you said, with Stam, are not particularly <laughs> pieces of art, it's a piece of propaganda, you know, that's what that is. Um, I always get the feeling they came off of a production line, though. Well, they probably did, because I said there really were thousands of them, so almost certainly yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, that statue was a piece of propaganda, so a piece of symbolism. So naturally, putting that up as a powerful symbol, well, so is pulling it down. That's the reverse symbol. So what you see in a lot of cases of statues being pulled down is that that's a sort of very deliberate response to the fact that, say, the regime involved cared about that symbol. So that's why it then becomes very powerful to attack that. And I think, you know, you can totally see that with Lenin. I mean, it's really striking to me that lots of European films made after the fall of communism, used the symbolism of pulling down a statue of Lenin. It was used in lots of fictional films as well, because that was such a powerful visual way of referring to that history. So I think it's not just the Saddam thing that set that, but I think what you can see is that on every side of politics, whether it's right, left, whatever it is, Baathist in Saddam's case, or, or whatever else it might be, is that Putting up and pulling down statues can both be very, very powerful symbols. And people know that it works. They know it gets attention and and that it is controversial. I think one of the reasons, I mean, it sound, this sounds obvious to say, but it's sort of an important point to get your head around is that statues look like people. So an attack on one of them looks like an act of violence against a person. As I say, it can be a sort of symbolic assassination. It isn't. It's an, it's an attack on an object. Um, but something like an obelisk doesn't command the same emotional resonance. People don't, people don't think of it in the same way. Whereas, you know, if you're smashing in the face of a Saddam statue with a hammer, it, it's got an emotional heft to it that other symbols don't. I think that's one of the reasons people respond so strongly. Have you seen the statue uh, of Lenin in uh, Krakow in Novahuta by any chance? Oh, don't know if I have specifically. Remind me. Right. So if people are listening, Google Novahuta. Lenin statue they pulled out the statue so it was in the middle of like this long alleyway and he was pointing to freedom and this beautiful you know horizon anyway load of fucking bullshit um and when they pulled him he was just like the ugliest statue in the world and they just pulled him down 
And um, what I find really interesting at this point is um, they just abandoned him in the forest and people could just like randomly walk up and really, really take their frustration out on him. Because it was, it was such a powerful moment. It was the end of communism and people just pulled down this Lenin statue, beat the shit out of it, put it in a forest. And then, and then some guy took it and has it in his garden. (laughs) Well, <laughs> a lot of them ended up like that. So, I mean, you know, Michael Heseltine, the former deputy prime minister of this country, has a giant Lenin head in his garden in Northamptonshire. <laughs> he bought it at an auction after the fall of communism, and there it is in his garden. It's huge, massive, great thing. You can see it if you Google, he's had photos taken of it and everything. So, I mean, if Michael Heseltine's got one in his garden, then, you know... They're rabbit holing seriously now, but is there not in Russia? It's near Moscow. There's a statue graveyard, isn't there, from com- communism, like a Soviet statue graveyard, and it's a tourist attraction that's right it's brilliant I mean I've been to obviously not going to Russia currently but I have been to Russia some years ago before all of this went down so it's right uh, opposite Gorky Park it's called Art Museum um, just on the side of the river and it's it's extraordinary I mean it's a lot of statues collected together kind of higgledy-piggledy some of them have got bits missing because some people have gone after them with hammers and I'm so going to show my intellectual capacity. Do you know how I know about it? Do you remember Goldeneye on the Nintendo? Is it Goldeneye? I was going to say, is it yeah. Goldeneye? <laughs> on the Nintendo 64, there was yeah. a level where you had to go in there. Um, look, we will get to what the, the statue everyone knows we're going to discuss, the British one. But Alina's not going to let this end without... I mean, and this is this is relevant right now. And I know she's going to want to ask you about the great Lenin bond fight. It's actually quite funny what's happening regarding Lenin now. Go on, Alina. Well... It- <laughs> Poland, so we, we discussed this very briefly, obviously, before we started the, the podcast, but I'll rephrase my question again and just give a little tiny bit of background to people who don't know what's going on. So in Poland at the moment, there is a massive uproar in um, getting rid of statues, especially uh, communist statues that happened uh, from 1945 up until the, the early 80s. And Russia's not taking that so well right now. And to do that, they're kind of pulling down some of our memorials in Russia. Belarus is now attacking graves and all sorts. So basically, it's causing massive chaos in in Eastern and Central Europe. I want to know what your opinion is on this whole fiasco is probably the best word for it. Well, I mean, you know, I'd love to write a volume two and get really stuck into it. I think it's fascinating. It's a sort of symbolic war, isn't it? I mean, literally a war of symbols is what's going on. Um, And I'm really interested in it. I mean, I do date it back to what I do write a bit about in the book is the Lenin fall in Ukraine. So this happened between about 2013, really revved up 2014, was done by 2017, is that they pulled down every statue of Lenin in Ukraine. Um, apart from two in the Chernobyl zone, which you can't go anywhere near because they're too radioactive. Um, But that was about 5,500 statues of Lenin, like an awful lot of them. And and that was done largely because at that time, I mean, lots of us, of course, will be thinking about this a lot now, but Ukraine was already at that stage feeling um, that Russia was being very aggressive and that these Lenin statues, as Ukrainians saw them, were symbols of Russian domination um, and Russian intervention so that's why they were pulled down and actually a lot of them were also amended in very interesting ways so there's one in Odessa and look it up it's brilliant it's on BBC News that some artists with uh with some very clever additions uh with resin managed to turn into a statue of Darth Vader so if you can imagine Lenin with his billowing cloak becoming you know you just put a little put a little hat on him and there he is Darth Vader and they installed wi-fi in it so useful as well which is very very clever indeed um it really interesting that it's kind of a way so it's like a a, for the weaker party so poland obviously you can't what can you do when he's threatening to push the button if anyone gets involved well you can damn well put his statues down or the ukrainians you might not be able to defeat the russian army um at that precise moment in 2013 or whatever but you could make a statement and statues are that statement Exactly. It's a powerful statement at that point. And it was a statement for Ukrainians at that point of wanting to be out from underneath Russian aggression, wanting to be their own country uh, with their own identity. And I mean, I think that's very much sort of related to what's going on in Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe now is is absolutely this is a discussion that's being had through communists. Actually, Russia's not even communist anymore, although Putin, of course, was a KGB operative. So he was connected to that regime. But certainly you know, is no follower of Lenin. But these symbols are all now understood very differently. These symbols are understood as being a kind of Russian, a a sort of Russian territorial marker. And that's how people are responding to them. And I mean, 
as a historian of this, I would say fair enough. I mean, this is often the case. And if you look, you know, if you go back to, we might talk about him later, but, you know, the first big rebellion against uh, Soviet power, obviously the Hungarian uprising in 1956, the first demand was to remove the giant statue of Stalin in Budapest. So there's a long history of this specifically regarding communism and the Soviet Union. I think let's come home because this is what would have kicked off the the concept for the book, I think, and kicked off this debate. Uh, The most famous modern example is Colston, isn't it? Uh, How much debate had that? So Lockie went to uni in Bristol, one of our co-hosts, and he's told us, even when I was at uni, which is depressingly long ago now, people wanted that statue gone. There's a lot of background to it, wasn't there? And it goes back, I mean, I don't know how old Lockie is, but I can tell you that debate has been going on for 100 years. He's He's probably not that old. (laughs) (laughs) So it really kicked off in about the 1920s, that debate. So it took a long time for that debate to come to fruition. The uh, Colston statue, I mean, I think there's a lot of misconceptions around it. So first of all, that statue went up in 1895, I think it was, um, 172 years after Colston's death, and was actually nothing really to do with Colston. It was put up by a Bristol... Uh, publisher called James Arrowsmith who made a fortune in publishing which unfortunately as we all now know is impossible today but (laughs) Victorian times was uh, you could do this Um, and he was what he was very concerned about was the rise of socialism that was then happening he wanted to reiterate that actually a better society in his view was a civic society which was quite paternalistic with you know a strict structure so Colston was a symbol of someone who'd been Um, a great philanthropist in Bristol, donated lots of money, you know, a wealthy man who'd used his wealth to improve the status of Bristol. But at that time in 1895, of course, the British Empire by then had become very, very anti-slavery. You know, slavery had obviously been outlawed. The British Empire then saw itself as really the world's leading opposition to the slave trade, you know, had been sending gunboats to stop it. So in fact, the fact that Colston had made a lot of his wealth through slavery was actually very unpalatable to Victorians. So that was the point at which that has, history had to be forgotten was when that statue was put up. So, you know, if you look at the ceremony, for instance, when it was put up, there was no reference at all to the slave trade, apart from it's in a subclause of something the mayor of Bristol said at the time, where he said most of his trade was with the West Indies. So, you know, if you were listening really carefully, yeah, yeah. Hard, in you might have, <laughs> yeah, you might have figured out what that was, but yeah, you had to be thinking quite hard. Um, so they were not acknowledging that. And actually, there was quite a big effort to cover up, really, that Colston's, you know, fortune had come very largely, not exclusively, but largely from the slave trade. And it was in the 1920s, as I said, that this began to be really rediscovered. And it was actually, first of all, through um, a reverend in Bristol who wrote biography very critically, because at that time, I mean, well, still, I imagine uh, there was great Christian opposition to the history of slavery. So it was coming not from the sort of radical left, but from uh, very much from a sort of religious point of view, this criticism of Colston initially. Um, And, uh, you know, I mean, poor old Colston and all this, of course, well, not poor old Colston. I mean, you know, let's let's let the guy take it. But certainly would have known nothing about socialism, a word that was invented a very long time after he died. um, And an idea that was after he died uh, had nothing to do with this whatsoever and never, to be fair, covered up his own involvement in the slave trade. So all of this would have, I can imagine, would have perplexed him immensely that any of this was even happening. But anyway, this was the debate. So yeah, really beginning in the 1920s. So, I mean, from that point, you have a hundred years till that statue gets pulled down, a very long time. And as you say, in Bristol, this had been going, the rest of the country, not necessarily aware of it, it's a local issue, but had been really kind of going back and forth, should we put a plaque on it? No one could agree what the plaque should say. Should we move it to a museum? But where, like, and I think actually when you look at it, in many ways, the lesson to take from the Colson statue is that Bristol Council had so many opportunities to do something about this before it got to the stage that it got to. You know, um, I'm probably more sympathetic to pulling it down than some people because I think it was done more thoughtfully and after more such a long time than people potentially realise. I think it was not just a furious mob. I think there was quite an interesting backstory to it. But I also think it should never have got to the stage where that happened. I think Bristol should have responded 
a long time before then. There were lots of things that could have been done. There were some very, very good artistic interventions as well, but again, not the council. But, you know, sort of, yeah. for instance, a wonderful uh, incident of yarn bombing, which I'm very keen on, which is when you knit something around a statue and someone at one point knitted a red ball and chain around his feet. And I thought that's a very powerful yeah. uh, symbolic protest. So, but this was being done, but this was all being done just by artists and people in Bristol. Again, as I say, the council was just being very... Um, you know very very they fact down. didn't they and where it is now is where it, i think it should have been which is is it not now in a museum it's with a, a museum. fact that says this isn't up anymore because this dude was a bit shady which pretty much really you could have that wouldn't have broken them to do that would it could have done that a long time ago <laughs> and avoided all of this but i think it's also quite important i mean that was obviously very very striking when that was pulled down and you know obviously a lot of strong feelings pro and anti all of that um but it's also important to say that in 2020, when that was happening in the UK, um, a lot of statues were being pulled down in America and so on. But that was actually the only one that was pulled down in the UK. Some were taken down by museums and so on, but those were they weren't pulled down by members of the public. It was only Colston that was actually pulled down, kind of in a in a in an unruly manner, <laughs> if you like. So, a question: I mean, how how is all of this an example uh, to us moving forward? Well, I think, I mean, my general feeling is that the way this should operate is that these should be questions for the local community. You know, any town, village, whatever that has to live with a statue should have the right to decide its own environment, not just the statue, but everything else about its own environment. And I don't think I wouldn't want to see any sort of blanket rules or me as a historian stomping in telling people what to do and not do. You know, if they love their statue, they can keep it if they don't. They don't have to. That's quite simple, really. Um, and I mean, what I've seen as well, of course, you know, this I, I'm all for this being done through democratic debate and democratic processes. Um, I feel that those do need to be transparent and efficient, which they weren't in Bristol, which led to this situation. Um, but I do think that, you know, these different generations will have different views and something that's, you know, I'm very relaxed about it, partly because a lot of the historical cases I've looked at, you know, what you will find is that statues get pulled down, but then a few years later, put up again, then pulled down again, put up again, reframed, put in a different place. You know, there's never a sort of end to the story, but I do think that every generation in each community does have the right to reassess its history and decide what it wants, who its heroes are, what it wants its built environment to be, you know, how it wants to arrange itself. Yeah, I'm totally fine with that I feel that that's just happened throughout history and is not a source to me of any anxiety I mean some of the uh, and again statues themselves of course vary a lot you know some of them as I say are artistically important um I would certainly be an advocate of anything artistically important being preserved in some way or other but you've already mentioned things like sculpture parks it's possible to preserve them somewhere that isn't necessarily you know, in a public space when we understand what it means to put something on a pedestal if I say I'm putting someone on a pedestal you understand that's not having a neutral historical debate about it that's raising it for worship whereas of course the context is totally different if you do put it in a museum or a sculpture park or somewhere else then I think you can have a very different conversation absolutely um I think can I just ask this is on our list of questions people perceive this as us growing as human beings don't they oh now we realize that people before had like the wrong idea and shouldn't have done it this way and we've grown as people and we're better people now there was very much that element coming off of some of the uh some of the more ardent people the ones that were making the hit lists of statues and things like that um that was quite smug and superior uh, how did you feel about all that I think there's a huge a historical element to trying to pretend there's any form of upward constant progress in history um I mean if you look at something like slavery there were always huge numbers of people opposed to it I mean I think that's an important part of the story to get across is that there was always huge opposition to slavery not least from slaves themselves who constantly had uprisings and rebellions and so on but also from you know actually quite a lot of wealthy white people were also deeply uncomfortable with it it has you know there was opposition to these things is not new at all um what happened with something like, as I say with Colston statue putting that up wasn't at all about endorsing slavery um it was about a very sort of local political issue at the time um 
And it wasn't at all that Victorians thought slavery was brilliant. They thought exactly the opposite, actually, on mass. Um, so, you know, it's quite an interesting and complicated story around that. But no, I think, you know, it, it's we should always assume that history is more complicated than we think, generally speaking. And I think this general idea that I really do go against that everybody in the past thought one way and now we all think another way is just untrue. I mean, it's tricky to ascertain because also, of course, as well, hardly have to tell you to this you'll definitely know it but you know when you are trying to get voices from the past well before about the 1960s people didn't have opinion polls we often can't access women's voices working class voices you know all of these sorts of things but the idea that we would go on the testimony of a few rich white men to say oh well in the past everybody loved slavery but of course now we're much wiser is to me completely ahistorical that's just that's yeah, absolutely not dug into that conversation at all. Um, as I said, the I reason was... a historian can't give you a straight answer about anything. Yeah, yeah, is that the documents aren't always there. The evidence isn't always there. But I think we'd be making a ridiculous assumption if we assumed that everyone at the time approved of slavery. They certainly didn't. I mean, we can show that they didn't. Um, and I certainly think we can uh, look at things like the history of slave rebellions and support for them quite often um, in in various Western European countries and so on to say that actually there was a lot of opposition to it then. Um, you know, I don't think we should assume that when these statues come down to us again, that like there has been some kind of democratic decision or that they represent majority opinion. They often really don't. Yeah. Um, if someone is listening in a post-apocalyptic bubble somewhere 5,000 years from now, I want you to know that everyone in London at the time hated the gherkin. There you go. And I mean, we didn't all vote to put up the Princess Diana statue either, which, no. I mean, God bless it, but it is a bit naff, let's be honest. You know. Yeah, it is. It sucks. I um, wasn't in England at the time, so I don't count in this conversation. Here. There we go. Fine. You're, you're completely innocent, but, you well, know. This, we've been quite Brit-centric uh, for the last one. Let's go somewhere else. Now, you think this guy was untouchable, right? But actually, anyone who knows the first thing about him knows shady side to him as well. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I begin and end the book with Washington, partly because I thought it was really, I wanted to begin with, you know, this very dramatic story. When, when Washington read out the Declaration of Independence in New York um, in, uh, in 1776, the first thing that his troops did was rush to uh, Bowling Green in New York and pull down the giant statue of George III. So, you know, when you had this kind of statue being, statues being pulled down uh, in 2020 and Donald Trump was saying this was un-American, yeah. I was saying, well, actually, it's the most foundational American event possible is to pull down a statue uh, that literally began your war of independence. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> it's not un-American. Um, and I think a lot of Americans would see that as completely justified and patriotic, in fact, that that was done. George Washington himself, it's important to say, did not order that and actually was a bit annoyed about it, not because he necessarily wanted to keep the statue, but he thought it was just disorderly conduct that he didn't particularly like seeing. So uh, so he didn't order it himself, but it did happen in response to, to his action um, and largely by his troops. And then, yeah, ending in Portland, Oregon in 2020, when a statue of George Washington himself was pulled down. And that was sort of quite deliberate to show that, you know, how history does move in these big circles. And I'm sure it will keep moving well beyond this story. Um, but it's interesting, it's been part of the whole story of the founding fathers who, you know, in the early years of the American Republic were not particularly fetishised, were not, you know, necessarily regarded as, you know, perfect heroes or demigods or anything like that. It's really, again, in the kind of 19th century that the sort of canonization of them really kicked up a gear, um, you know, in this side and sort of really intensifying through the 20th century. And I think that was partially because after the Civil War, that was a piece of history that you could reach back to to unite America. You know, it was... What's the Mount Rushmore? That's 30s? 40s? Yeah, it is. It's early 20th century. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and and has a very interesting, complicated story itself of, like, being partly intended as almost religious pilgrimage site, mm. but, of course, also being uh, done on the site of a Native American actual sacred site as well. So very complicated mm -hmm. monument, that one. Um, but yeah, so they, so really started to rank up then. So, I mean, there's sort of been this, you know, canonization of the founding fathers. And it's not very surprising to me that now in the way of history keeps turning like a cog, that of course that's getting challenged because people are saying, well, hold on a minute, you know, George Washington had 300 slaves and appropriated Native American lands. And those were clearly the issues 
when his statue was pulled down in Portland, Oregon, um, because what was written on him was very much kind of all about sort of George Floyd, uh, the date 1619, which is considered to be the first date that um, slaves were taken from Africa to the US. Um, and also, you know, slogans like you're on native land. So it's very obvious that those were the contentious issues. Yeah. And I mean, and I think when you come to someone like Washington, I mean, of course, the fact is, I mean, I don't believe in a balance sheet. I don't think these things cancel each other out. I don't, I mean, George Washington was an extraordinary general, um, an incredibly accomplished politician, a slave owner, and somebody who appropriated native lands. And all of these things are true at once. And the interesting thing to understand is not trying to go, oh, on one hand, this, on the other hand, this. It's more to say, well, isn't it interesting that all those things coexisted in this man at this time? What does that tell us about who he was and what his time was and what, you know, what was the kind of, you know, what was the circumstance at the time? So I think, you know, it, we just have to acknowledge that people historically are very complicated <laughs> and that, that it's not about coming out with a necessarily a thumbs up or thumbs down, but appreciating and digging into that complexity. Yeah, I think we interviewed Annette Gordon-Reed on this about her, because um, she obviously did all the Sally Hemings research. Yeah, so Thomas Jefferson as well. The relationship with the slave woman who was probably only about 14 years old as well and I mean like how much of this is us judging it by our own modern standards because a 14 year old bride is not really considered a big deal in 1776 is it well it is because I mean he concealed it so if it hadn't been a bit shameful why would he have concealed it is an interesting Mm. question why would there have been so much denialism around it and around the we know children he had with her and so forth um And, you know, it's very different from his public pronouncements on slavery. I mean, Jefferson is so full of contradictions on this, you know, really one of, you know, a very, I mean, he had 600 slaves, which put him really in the kind of, you know, top, top echelon of slaveholders in the US. That was a huge number. Um, And, you know, sort of lots of talk about freedom and freeing them, very much contradicting with his actions, you know, lots of... Uh, also bragging about how much money he was making out of the birth of new slaves. Um, So it's a world of contradictions and complexity in all of this. And, you know, incredibly interesting. (laughs) As I say, I find the complexity of it very interesting. I don't want to kind of screen any of it out. Um, But I I think we we know it must have been shameful because it's hidden. And also that Jefferson biographers, of course, hid it for many years as well. Um, It was, you know, things were excised from his memoirs when he talked about, for instance, his slaves being whipped and so on. Those were actually removed from his papers and so on by historians who thought it looked bad um, in the 20th century. So, you know, there's been a lot of kind of erasure of history through all of this. Um, And I think actually restoring some of that's really important because it's about understanding the complexities of the time. I think we should finish off by going east in terms of individuals, um, possibly to Alina's favourite person in history. (laughs) His 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 penis in the middle of Warsaw. Is that what we're talking about? (laughs) Yeah, you hate that building, don't you? God, I hate that building. Oh, (laughs) so one of my students actually referred to it and I'm going to use this forever is the uh, Palace of Science and Culture is now officially going to be referred to as Stalin's penis. (laughs) there we go it basically is because it totally is right so alex has brought it up let's talk about stalin uh and stalin's statue in budapest so what is the context to this one being taken down well this statue was put up um in the 1950s basically as a sort of a a birthday gift it was supposed to be stalin Um, and it's a fascinating statue inherently to me because um it's Part of, part of this story is to tell you how the story of statues being put up is often also a story of destruction. You know, people think the destruction is when you pull them down. That statue was largely made from the bronze of older Hungarian statues that the communists didn't like that had to be melted down to make that statue. So many other statues had to be destroyed to create the bronze for this statue. And also where it was put on the edge of the big city park there, um, in order to fit it in there, they had to demolish... Um, a church and a tram station uh, and um, various other things to fit it in there. So I'm sorry, to- I have to laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting, I've muted myself because I've been hysterically laughing behind this, but 
this is just this this is the same story throughout the whole of eastern and central europe that just to bring up some ugly building or some ugly statue that is of stalin they have to destroy things they have to melt things down it's just total utter destruction just to put up this stupid horrible evil statue exactly and i mean you know obviously you are very very fully respect your position on this I mean I'm trying to be a neutral historian here but yeah pretty good. I mean, and also I think the reason that Stalin was so keen on having massive statues of himself everywhere was genuinely partially a big brother is watching you you know this statue was put there to intimidate people it was put there to make people in Budapest think he's there he can see me and that was really emphasized in the propaganda around it so you could see that for instance it was it was said in the newspapers that you know that aren't we so lucky because now we can go and ask the statue when we have a problem, we can speak to it and, you know, our great father will not deny us. So it's being posited as a piece of religious iconography, you know, that you're actually supposed to pray to it effectively. Um, so, I mean, that tells you a lot about what was intended by putting that statue up. Um, so it didn't last very long <laughs> because this, uh, the 1956 uprising came along in Hungary, um, as I said, really the first really great rebellion against Soviet control in Eastern Europe. And it was the first demand of the protesters that got together to um, to march in Budapest was to pull that statue down. They decided to go and do it themselves um, on really day one of their rebellion. So it was about somewhere between 100,000, 200,000 people progressed to City Park to pull this statue down and were in the square. And it was incredibly hard to pull down. Now, I don't know if you've seen the footage of Edward Colson's statue getting pulled down. That takes like 30 seconds at most. You know, they get some rings around it and it just goes bonk. I mean, straight over. Obviously, the thing was so cheap. <laughs> Stalin's statue was enormous and very heavy. And so even though there were like 100,000 people there, you know, pulling at it and they originally had ropes or the ropes snapped. Then they tried, you know, they were getting like wire ropes. They had some guy with metal cutting equipment kind of going at its feet and all of this stuff and soaring it to bits. And the crowd was shouting, come on, little Joseph. And, and all of this to kind of entice him down. And apparently there was a sort of carnival atmosphere. Everyone was having a lovely time at this point. And eventually it took like a couple of hours. This enormous thing eventually kind of creaked and fell off, just leaving its boots there. And afterwards, everyone, I mean, you were talking earlier about the Statue of Lenin that was taken to the wood. Very similarly, people were jumping on it, tearing bits off it. Um, if you can see, if you look at pictures of it afterwards lying in the street, that uh, the letters WC have been written on its face. And I'm afraid I think it was so used. Yes. Um, He's going to be amazed if people didn't pee on him as well. Got peed on. Um, I know, would have. There we go. I mean, everyone <laughs> did. That is a mental image. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Good for you. As a so, yeah, so I mean, Alina can't do the neutral thing with Stalin. I mean, I think that's kind of okay. Stalin's yeah. pretty bad. It's okay yeah. not to be neutral about Stalin. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, so, so you know, all of this, I mean, absolutely sort of extraordinary, kind of a really sort of joyous event pulling this thing down that really bonded people. But, of course, as you all know, very, very sadly, the Hungarian rebellion was put down with an extraordinary imposition of Soviet power uh, that happened at the same time, kind of real brutality, um, tanks rolled into Budapest. And people who had were known to have been involved in pulling that statue down were imprisoned uh, then in very large numbers. And apparently there was a little code in prison for many years afterwards in Hungary that if you met somebody, say, what you're in for? And you'd say, I'm a sculptor. And that meant you were somebody who'd been involved in pulling down this statue. So they saw it as a work of art in and of itself to pull down that statue. And I have to say, I think the way it was done, arguably a far greater work of art than the statue itself. Excellent. Alex, not Alex Churchill, by the way, <laughs> the other Alex. Uh, Alex, Alex, this is Alex. Um I'm seeing double. Anyway, moving on. Listen, I want to say thank you. This has been so enlightening. I love this. I got a chance to vent my frustration about Stalin. We got to talk about, oh my God, we got talked about everything. We talked about Washington. We talked about uh, British statues, Queen Victoria. God, Alex got a bit of Queen Victoria out of there. Uh, made her very happy. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. A congratulations on your nomination. Um, we would have voted for you. It's okay. I would have voted for you. With that Stalin statue, I would have voted for you. So. I guess we've literally only covered half the statues in this interview as well. So go out and buy the book. Uh, we will put it in the History Hack bookshop. Uh, so that people can buy it from us and not Amazon, because as Zach will tell you all, Jeff Bezos will just spend it on rocket fuel. And if you use bookshop.org <laughs> or independent booksellers, you support Alex uh, and we might get paid too. So Alex, thank you so much. Thank you guys. It's been such a pleasure. <laughs>
When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.